Coming up on Real Talk Rentals, we're going to talk dispositions. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. We're going to get all into it and break it down for you. Welcome to Real Talk Rentals, a podcast brought to you by On Q Property Management. We're going to give you the inside scoop on property management and everything that goes on behind the scenes. I'm Ben, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Mr. Eric Dixon, the uh, go-to expert on all things rental property and real estate here in Arizona. Uh, on this episode, we're going to jump into something that I think a lot of people are probably unfamiliar with terminology-wise, but we say all the time here in the property management world, and sometimes we forget other people don't know what it is, and that is dispositions. So... Eric, I'm going to throw this to you. What is a disposition? Yeah, so it's funny because before we record these, you know, we know what we're going to talk about vaguely, but uh, I was telling my wife, she's like, what's the next one about? It's like, oh, it's a lovely one, dispositions. And she's like, what's that? You know, yeah. like, what exactly? And I'm like, well, it's kind of a, you could say it's a boring topic, but I want to kind of unpeel it to realize that, uh, so everyone realizes it's not that it's boring, but it's super important, number one. and. Uh, Number two is we'll make it interesting because around the disposition in property management, there's a lot of uh, funny, hairy stories that, uh, that happen. So a disposition is better well known, at least um, as property managers, we say disposition or the dispo. That's kind of just like the terminology. But if you say that, hey, Ben, you're an owner. It's like, yeah, we're doing the dispo today. You're like, dude, what, what's that? Yeah. So the, the first like month I worked here, I didn't want to be the guy that was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and you guys were like, we're doing dispos right now. And I was like, oh, dude, okay, take it, cool. take it further. Cool. I was signing owners up for our service and I didn't know what a disposition was, you know, cause I was <laughs> signing them up, dude, I would sign up the, the management agreement. And then I'm like, you know, we lease it out and then it's the property manager's problem. I'm back talking to the, to the new, new clients. Right. So, um, it took, took a long time just to understand, but really what the disposition is, is the security deposit disposition. So it's a breakdown of the charges after a tenant moves out of what you're going to charge them out of their deposit or what they owe after move out. Right. And so it breaks that up. And so for example, if you have a thousand dollar refundable security deposit, you would have that at the top and then you, you know, charge, let's say $300 of, of damage and neglect that the tenant did, then they would show a $700 refund but part of that disposition is breaking down the actual charges. It's not just like, yeah, 300 bucks for cleaning. It's like, no, you need to have a work order or an invoice or a detailed you know, uh, breakdown of that. Um, I would say too, the, the security deposit disposition and the process and the liability involved is one of the main reasons people hire a management company. Sure. Again, whether it's us or somebody else, you think about self-managing and uh, they have no idea. A lot of people, they buy their first rental or they convert their primary residence into their first rental because they bought another house. They have no idea that there's laws around timeframes and what you can charge and not charge. There's a depreciation uh, on different things. And so it's just one of the things, hey, that's one of the reasons people hire us. Um, I would also say um, what, what I was getting at with that. Oh, it was, uh, I'm not going to say his name on here actually. So <laughs> one, one of our, uh, clients, he's a current client now, but when I was signing him up, it's actually an individual I know went to high school with him. Right. And so, um, he's like, Hey dude, I've been managing this place forever. I think I'm done. Like, it's just, he probably had a bad experience. I can't remember. I went and met him at the house. The tenant had just moved out. And so I'm thinking, um, you know, the house needed a lot of work. And I'm thinking, Hey, did you do the disposition? And I think I said disposition, like, Hey, did you do the disposition to break down the charges? He's like, no, but I just sent him a text and said, you're not getting your deposit back. <laughs> and I was like, you know, that, that's it. That's so it. I just sent him a text. Hey dude, you're not getting your deposit back. And I was like, Oh dude, uh, well, we're not going to do it for you. Cause we didn't manage the lease and all that. But here's the thing. You got to do it within 14 business days. You need to send it. You need to, um, make sure that you can prove that you delivered it to them, whether it's by mail, certified mail, in person, whatever. Um, and then they have to be actual charges. And he's like, well, dude, it's trashed. And then I went down and talked to him. Well, how old is your carpet that he trashed? And how old is the paint? And how old is this? And we went through it and he's like, dude, uh, I'm like nervous. I should probably <laughs> refund some of his deposits. Like, yeah, dude, you, you probably should. Because yeah. if you don't do it right, at least in Arizona, they're eligible for two and a half, time, two and a half times the refundable deposit if the landlord or the property manager screws up, right? So it's sure. like, oh yeah, screw up, the, send that text. He thinks he's good. 
And then if the tenant knows what they're doing, they could, for that thousand dollar refundable deposit, they're eligible for twenty five hundred dollars, if uh, you know if if they win the uh, the case there. So, yeah, and I think that is like a number one fear that the tenants have is this assumption, you know, that like they're just going to get that text message that says you're not getting it back, and it's oh, yeah. like, are you just keeping that or yeah, what, what's happening here? <laughs> um, so this is really like an itemized list, right? Yeah. That it's like a, a receipt. That's this is what the money is going to be spent on. Yeah, and so we we send ours with uh with an itemized list is correct, and then in addition to that, with the estimates or contractors invoices, depending on what it is, right? So if you're charging them for replacement of carpet, chances are that you know by the time you send that out, the carpet's not actually replaced yet, but you have contracted the work. Right. What you can't do, and I think we'll get into this. Uh, in a different scenario, but, um, you can't say I'm going to replace the carpet and not replace the carpet. Right. Right. <laughs> and then, to, you know, charge them, you know, keep the money and then use that money to either pocket or eh, I just re-rented it with yeah. the crappy carpet. I'll just vacuum it myself and yep. it's good. No, the carpet's exactly. good. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about putting this list together, how crucial are things like photographic evidence or like pictures? You know, I hear a lot of, customer saying, well, I left it cleaner than I got it, you know? And if, is it enough to just say, no, it was dirty? Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, so what we do because, and we, we didn't start this way 12 years ago, you know, and we, we did move in inspections, but we more leaned on the tenant to, you know, hold them accountable. But then we started doing actual move in inspections and actual move out inspections shortly after we started but it makes it so much easier. I mean, if right. you take a picture of the kitchen before and the kitchen after, and you're like, no, there's a hole in the cabinet. It wasn't there when you moved in. It is there now, you know, and, and the biggest determination you have to figure out is, is it wear and tear? A hole in the cabinet's not wear and tear, or is it damage and neglect? Wear and tear, you can't charge for. Right. Um, and, and, you know, if they're there for one year or if they're there for 10 years, wear and tear is a different definition. You know, it's like, right. you know, the lifespan of carpet and the lifespan of paint and so forth has, has a, a life, but wear and tear, you can't charge for damage and neglect is holes more than a pinhole or more than like a nail hole. Um, you know, if they, they hung a big screen TV and they just ripped it off the wall sure. or even if they took the bracket off and you've got seven bolts and it's like, dude, those are good size. Like, Hey, we have to fix that before you leave. Um, I'd say the biggest, most common charge is cleaning. And some tenants, they, they're like, well, you're going to clean, you're going to charge me anyway. I'm just going to not clean it. And those sure. are actually, then we have to charge like deep cleaning and it's even more. Uh, but I would say carpet cleaning and cleaning are like, we don't want to charge those. They take time. No one's making money. And, um, and it's, it's harder and we have to charge you. But those are the most common. Touch up paint is a hard one because it's like subjective sometimes. Like, does the touch up even look good? Right. <laughs> Does the sheen match the color match? Um, landscape cleanup is a super common one. And a lot of times they're like, I just couldn't get around to it. We moved. U-Haul had to go. Can you just charge me for the landscaping? And so a lot of these tenants, they turn in their keys and they know, hey man, I'm going to get charged for cleaning. I'm going to get charged for landscaping. I'm going to get charged for carpet cleaning. Right. I put a hole in that one door oh. on the way out. My pool table knocked, you know, put a dent in the wall. Yeah. And they kind of are expecting certain things. You know, we try to make it so they're not surprised. Right. I, I would, one thing that I've noticed on, on Dispose that people seem to be surprised by that they shouldn't be is um, they'll just leave stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, just a garage full of things. And they'll be like, well, I didn't want that stuff. And it's like, well, somebody's got to throw it. Now we got to yeah. pay a guy to go down there with the truck, load it up, take it to the dump. It doesn't just disappear. Yeah. And I, I would say the biggest challenge was that with that is that in their mind, they're like, dude, just have a guy with the truck, pay him 50 bucks and run it to the dump or go find a dumpster in the fries parking lot, the grocery store parking lot. Yeah. And, and it, we're a license. We have to hire a license bonded insured contractor, you know, for liability's sake, they won't even show up to a house for under hundred bucks. Like right. you know, legit, whether it's a company we use or a random person off Google, it's like, between fuel and wages and stuff, it's like they can't even show up. And then if you have to charge dump fees, they're not going to put it in a grocery store dumpster. No, they're going to yeah. put it at their dumpster at their yard, or they're going to take it to uh, 
to the dump. And it's like, dude, a haul off like that, even a small haul off is hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And they're like, no, I would have just told my neighbor to put it in his black barrel if I would have known that. Yeah. You know, so there is like, oh man, then why did you leave a garage full of crap? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I see that all the time. Um, it's funny. My, I'm going to put my wife on blast here for a little bit, but she, uh, she is like the cleanest person I know, like just to a T, like vacuum every night, you know, wipe down all the counters, just clean, clean, clean. But she uses the word filthy all the time. She'll say the house is filthy. And then I look at her and say, honey, I've, I've seen filthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not filthy. This is some toys need to be yeah. put away. Like we've yeah. seen what people turn in sometimes they're like, I don't care. You clean it. And it's like, that is a level of filthy. Yeah. And, and it's funny that you mentioned that because we use that. I mean, that happens with the, when we sign up clients to use our service and for tenants moving in. And we realize that your wife's definition, my wife too, their definition of clean is it's a high bar. Like yeah. that is a high bar, right? Some of our owners that we bring on, their level of clean is low. And we have to educate them. That's like, yo, yo, I, I know you say it's clean, but it smells like your pets and this carpet needs replaced. And they're like, oh, it's been like that the whole time I've lived here. And I'm sitting there going, okay, first of all, that's disgusting. <laughs> but se second of all, um, you know, that's not acceptable. Like the tenant, you have yeah. to understand that the higher you put the bar, the better tenant you're going to attract. Yeah. You know, you imagine walk, walking into a rental and your wife is like, now this is filthy. So if she thinks your house is filthy. Go look at one of the rentals on the market, not one of ours, but one of these that is not clean. And she would yeah. just be like, I can't even look at this place. Yeah. And I, I think that's like, uh, you kind of touched on in the previous uh, question, but you get, uh, tenant to think and and some owners honestly try and do this that it's like i'll just move someone in here when they move out i'll use the security deposit to replace oh, the carpet dude that that is a mindset that is in it's out there yeah right? and and it's been used over and over and over and i think one thing that it's that's important to understand too is tenants aren't it's not it, i think it used to be this like negative connotation a little bit like you're a tenant and you're renting it's like no dude that's number one people a lot of people are renting because they have flexibility. It's like, sure. I'm not wrapped in a 30 year mortgage on this house that could go up and down. Mm -hmm. I can move year to year. I don't have to, I don't have to pay for repairs. Like, dude, it is not bad to rent. Now, you know, if you're going to rent for 10 or 20 or 30 years, like, yeah, there might be a better option, like, but long, sure. you know, investment wise, but there's not a negative connotation to it. And we need to realize that I say that because tenants are smart. Like they are good qualified applicants that we get every single day. They're not stupid. Like they want a clean house just like you do. They want a good school district. They want stuff taken care of, you know? And so we 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 try and educate the owners as we bring them on. Like we're not just like, you're not the high and mighty landlord and the tenants down here. It's like actually a lot of times, more often than not, the tenants that apply make more money, have better credit yeah. <laughs> than, than some of our landlords, you know? Sure. And, um, and you touched on that too, like with the, isn't there like a certain amount, like if you have carpet and it's been in there for 10 years, you can't yeah. charge them for brand new carpet, yeah. right? It's already has a certain depreciation, like paints the same way. Yep. And so this is a lot of people don't like to hear this, right? So I will throw, this is an extreme example, but it happened here of a house we manage. So I'm not going to say names, but if they're listening, they know who this is. Cause it's just so <laughs> unique that they, that they're like, Oh, that's me. But, um, they, and they texted me about the podcast so that I know that at least maybe they'll listen to this one. Right. Yeah. So, so they bought back in 2003 or four, this house was built in Santan Valley, brand new build. It's actually back then it was way out in the boonies right now. It's like in town. Yeah. Well, you know, the market crashed, whatever 2013 comes around. The house is over 10 years old, almost 10 years old, I think. It has never been lived in one time. So it got caught up in some litigation. Some builder went under, then the market crashed. And this, this thing was roped up forever. We, I helped them buy it as the buyer's agent, helped them buy it as a foreclosure. They actually bought two of this builder's houses right on the same street. Um, but everything's in mint condition. It actually felt like you're going back in time because you walk in and you're like gold light fixtures, brand new carpet, brand new paint. Oh, the house is 10 years old. That's yeah. weird. So we rented it out. And the first tenant in one of them, unfortunately, was there for a year. They trashed the carpet. I mean, it needed to be replaced. Absolutely. There was no ifs, ands, or buts, right? So the owner's like, 
I told them, hey, we need to depreciate the carpet. Unfortunately, the carpet is over 10 years old. Right. You can't charge them to replace it. It's past its life expectancy. So um, our attorneys and any attorney is going to tell you that life, you know, the life of a uh, carpet and paint is five to 10 years. And it's actually been decided on several cases that it's seven years is what we should use. So we've, we've been advised to use seven years. So if your carpet is uh, brand new and they move in today after a year, it needs replaced. You can charge them for six sevenths of the cost of the carpet, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, so you take out one year, that's two years. You take out two years or whatever. If it's over seven years old, and they trash that carpet, unfortunately, you've got to eat that cost. And it's just, it's a depreciated amount. Um, you know, if they trash the carpet, you're going to get them for other things. You sure, know, the yeah, deposit's going to be depleted with <laughs> landscape cleanup, carpet, you know, uh, touch up paint, damage to the holes in the walls and so forth anyway. But you have to realize as, an, as a landlord, you're not always going to have this deposit that you can just make the house rent ready again. Sure. You know, paint is the same way, seven years. You know, you go in there and there's hand marks, the dogs licked the walls and stuff. If the house hasn't been painted in, in the last seven years, you're likely going to be responsible for the whole cost. And so you kind of need to know as a landlord, like you need to budget for it. Hey, every five to 10 years, I'm going to have to replace the carpet in this house and I'm going to have to repaint this house. Right. Um, and so that is a hard pill to swallow, especially for somebody like your wife, if she's a landlord yeah. and she's like, what do you mean they don't vacuum every day? Yeah. We, we have move outs that they didn't vacuum one time in their tenancy. And I don't mean that as a, as some offshoot example. It's like, no, that happens. Yeah. Like people don't have vacuums. My, that's, my that's first apartment I lived in when I moved on, my parents lived with two other guys and we owned no vacuum and no, no cleaning utensils right. or things of any right, yeah. kind. <laughs> You're not renting from us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I was 18 and you know, yeah, yeah. No, not and, a care in the world. Re reality is, I mean, getting back to it is like, you just have to know, okay, if you're self-managing or whether you're hiring somebody, make sure they understand, make sure you as the investor understands mm -hmm. the life expectancy of certain things. Appliances, it's 10 years. Now, if they trash, if they're like, they took a hammer to the stove and it's 10 years old, you can charge them for some of it. But sure. if it's just like wear and tear to the point of replacement and it's over 10 years old, it's like, dang it, I got to eat that. But you know what? That's part of what's being an investor is. You right. know, I got to invest in this property and over time you'll get your return later. So what happens then, let's say we send out the dispo. Um, oh, see, you're using dispo and, a, and people understand see, it now. They, they get it now. Uh, <laughs> we send it out. Um, and the tenant now doesn't agree on it and says, you know yeah. what, that carpet is not that trashed, you know, and is it, how does this work? Like the push and pull of that? Yeah. So, um, you know, in our disposition, even at the bottom, it even opens the door for that. So it's not like, here you go, sucker, closed door. And then yeah. they have to like, Hey, how do I respond? We even say at the bottom, Hey, if you want to dispute any of these charges, because we're confident in the before and the after pictures, right? Right. But we're also human. And so I can't tell you that, you know, how many times we've made a mistake, right? And it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize. I'm, I thought the picture I was looking at was the master. That was the kid's bedroom. You're right. Like that. The, right. And so they're, they're, uh, our property managers are amazing. Like they, they deal with a lot, and, but they're doing a lot of these and there are mistakes made. So if you make a dispute, we will research it. It usually involves their manager, you know, the property manager's manager, and then we review it and then we'll respond within 10 days. So it's one of those things. They have 30 days to dispute it. Then we have 10 days. There isn't a law with that as far as, you know, timeframes, but our policy is that. I have to think that's where it gets kind of tricky if you're self-managing, right? Sure. Even if you're legit and you type up a word doc and you say, here's the breakdown, you send it over. What if they text you, harass you? This is bull crap. I'm not paying. Yeah. I'm not paying this. You say I owe you money, blah, blah, blah. By the way, that is the worst is when they think they're getting a, they think they're getting a refund check. They tear that thing open and they're like, wait, I owe, I owe money. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, dude, you, yeah. And that, that's where we get more disputes than not is where they owe. And it's not even that we change it. It's like, Hey, let's have a, let's have a 20 minute conversation and educate each other on this process. Right? Sure. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the re the reason I even say that is on a disposition, it's not just damage and neglect. There's also unpaid charges. So let's say in the lease that I'm the tenant and I get HOA fines because I parked my trailer in the, in the garage or outside the garage and I get 50 bucks a month that the owner's paying. Well, the owner's going to seek reimbursement. And if they didn't pay that along the way, and you've got, we, I can't tell you how many 
backed HOA reimbursements or sure, yeah. late fees that that were from the last month's rent that were like, well, it's their last month. We'll just, we'll collect it out of the deposit or whatever. So those unpaid charges are going to be on, on there as well. So they're like, oh, I left that place spick and span. And they're like, yeah, but your HOA charge from last quarter, you didn't reimburse it yet. Boom. Ding yeah. got that. And so sometimes it's just educating them. Yeah. Um, so then <laughs> I think we, we've touched on a, on a, on a couple here. And obviously the goal with these things is always to be, you know, transparent, fair, honest, so both people can see so that there's no questions asked. But I know we've seen some crazy stories over there. You mentioned the the house that was empty for yeah. 10 years. Well, and the house that was empty for 10 years, I'm coming back to that only because it wasn't just the carpet issue, right? Yeah. That the owners had it in their mind that these houses were brand new. Yeah. And so when the AC went out, you know, two months into it, they automatically think the tenant did something to that AC unit. Yeah. And we had to remind them like, no, the AC unit didn't turn on for the first 10 years of its life. Yeah. The parts are old, the Freon, whatever. Right. And it's so out in the weather, it's yeah, rusted. It's, it's, yeah. And you have to think this house didn't have AC forever. It gets 120 in the summer. It gets, you know, cold in the winter. Yeah. Everything's contracting, expanding, all that stuff. And it's just, that one was interesting because a disposition comes and they're like, what do you mean the blinds are all cracked? What do you mean this, that, and the other? And it's like, did the this is the first time a human lived in this home? Yeah. A lot of the things with this house are not the tenant's fault. And it was an uphill battle, right? We ended up managing both of those homes for many, many, many years. Um, they have since sold them for four times what they paid for them. So, so they're fine. So they're fine. <laughs> and us dealing with the dispositions each time, I mm -hmm. mean, it just, it worked itself out. But it was an education process. Um, I actually, so I, I pinged Ryan, he's a director of property management and, uh, and Carrie, the director of leasing, who has actually been, um, a property manager for many years too. Right. So I just said, Hey, look, we're doing a podcast next week on dispos. And they're like, Oh, it sounds boring, horrible. It's the worst part of a property manager's <laughs> job. Right. <laughs> sounds, it sounds amazing. Um, and I'm like, no, we need to make it fun. Like what's the craziest story. So, so one was Ryan mentioned, um, he said, oh yeah, we had this owner, carpet's trashed. You know, there, there's probably a lot of different details, but he said, she literally sent me an invoice that said, because the tenants trashed the flooring, I have to replace the flooring, but I want to put in travertine. And it was $18,000 to put travertine. And this is like a $2,000 rental. Um, we could charge the tenant for replacing the carpet, but she's like, no, I want him to pay for the travertine. And I'll even work with them a little bit, but they owe me $18,000. And Ryan's just like, dude, are you serious? Yeah. And he's like, this has to be a joke. Like, do you mean 1800 or do you understand? Like you can't, she's like, well, I don't think it's fair. I wouldn't have to put travertine if they didn't trash my carpet. <laughs> and he's like, she like tripled down, right? Like yeah. over and over. And it ended up being to the point where I think I was involved as the broker to say, Hey, look, we're putting our foot down here. Yeah. If you want to charge those things, we are going to tell the tenant that we've severed service and you're going to have to do this, that, and the other. And she basically just threw a, threw a fit and we worked through it, but, uh, and we still manage it. So yeah. he's like, Hey, look, she's a good owner. It, it was just a matter of, of educating. And then at the end of the day, it ended up being, being, uh, being okay. Um, could you imagine uh, you, you think you're going to get, uh, maybe I'll get 500 bucks back from my security deposit and you open up the thing and it's a bill for for 18, 18 grand. <laughs> You're like, no, there has to be a mistake. No, that's and, gotta be a decimal and point. And so issue. Part, part of what we have to do is is working with our owners. They, they're the best clients in the world. And a lot of them just it's either their first time through it or sure. hey, I've had such good tenants for year after year. And then they have this bad one and they're like, it just sours the whole right. relationship. So a lot of it is like, Hey, look, you trust us. We trust you. We'll build this relationship of trust, but you got to trust us. You know, it yeah. sounds cliche, but trust us. Like part of our job is to keep you out of the crosshairs of being sued. Yeah. Like, that's part of our job. And so we have to tell them, Hey, look, technically I might be able to, this is gray area, but I got to say you're opening the door to a lawsuit or you're opening the door to small claims court, or you're opening, you know, I got to say, I literally got served, uh, for small claims yesterday for a disposition from September of last year. So it was 12 months ago. Um, it's actually a, as strange as it sounds, it's a tenant that ended up catching up and they paid what was owed. And then one year later they're, they're fighting it. And I only bring that up because it, it was one that, uh, 
that actually we had settled outside of, uh, of attorneys and stuff. And then that now they're like, well, that was separate. I'm going after you. So sometimes you just can't make the tenant happy. Sure. Um, so that's an extreme example. Another example, I actually pulled up in an email. Um, and so I wrote it down here in, in quotes, but so the carpet's trashed and I feel like all the, all the stories are carpets trashed, I mean, but yeah, <laughs> it's the easiest but, thing to but, trash. But one of the reasons we bring it up is it usually depletes the whole deposit. Yeah. Even if it's prorated, it's like replacing carpets expensive. So the, the tenant fought it in small claims court and in the small claims, uh, reasoning of why she doesn't think we should get charged was you knew I was a single mother with four kids. This is expected wear and tear. You should have to replace the carpet. And it's like, this has nothing to do with a single mom or four kids, but it was almost just like her mindset was you understood. I had pets and kids. The carpet was going to get trashed. Yeah. You can't charge me to clean the carpets. You knew I was busy <laughs> when you rented yeah, to me. Yeah, I, I couldn't can't be expected to clean yeah. up after myself. That's and part crazy. of me reads that. It's like, dude, you feel bad. Like, yeah. you, don't, you don't want to, to your point, you want to be fair and honest and above board. But sometimes being fair and honest does not make both parties happy. Yeah. In fact, most of the times we charge tenants for charges, the owner still is not satisfied yeah. because they hear us tell them, nope, can't charge for that. Can't charge for that. Can't charge for that. And they're like, are you kidding me? What can I charge for? And we're like, well, these are the legitimate uh, damage and neglect charges. Yeah. You can't charge for touch up paint in this house that you painted 15 years ago. Yourself. Well, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I lived there my whole life. I didn't have to. And I'm like, doesn't matter, dude. Like yeah. you're not ready to be an investor. You're not ready to be a landlord if you can't stomach some of this. So, um, you know, our whole job is to educate, represent them in the way. And I can't tell you how many times I tell them part of our job is to keep you out of the courtroom, yeah. keep you out of getting served, keep you out of even uh, demand letters from attorneys. Like I can't tell you how many tenants have friends that are attorneys that send us a demand letter or something. And we're like, you know, and we spell it out and we, we show everybody that it is, it's fair. This is an honest thing. And usually it just fizzles out and the attorney's like, Oh, they didn't tell me that or right. they, didn't, they yeah. didn't show me that invoice or, or whatever. Um, so the, I would say those are the most extreme examples. Um, at the end of the day with the disposition, the education piece of this, that hopefully that you take away from this as investors, future investors, self-managing landlords, or if you have another PM company that is not us is make sure that they are, and that you or they are uh, doing it within the time frame. So in Arizona, it's 14 business days. If you wait to that 15th business day to do that disposition, you're out of luck. You're They're lost. eligible for yeah. two and a half times the deposit. And so, you know, don't even flirt with the line. You know, make sure you get it get it closer. Um, the other thing is make sure that you're prorating damages. So, you know, if it's an extreme case, you might be able to charge the full amount, but for the most part, you got to prorate and depreciate it. Just right. like if I was to uh, have an insurance claim on my house, the insurance adjuster is going to say, oh yeah, we'll replace your cabinets, but they're 20 years old. You're not going to get 2022 full price replacement cabinets. Right. You're going to get full price, less depreciation. So you got to factor in depreciation with that. Um, and at the end of the day, you just have to be able to stand behind it. So say these charges, X, Y, and Z, if I'm standing in front of a judge at small claims court, can I 100% stand straight up and say, nope, this is legit. Yeah. If it's gray, you know, you need to make it black and white. <laughs> yeah. That, that's all. I guess that that's kind of the what I would say the conclusion is. No, like. I like that. Yeah. If it's gray, you got to make it black and white. Yeah. It's got to be <laughs> straightforward to where anybody would look at it and say, that's fair, you know, and that you're in the right on that yeah. one. All right. Well, man. Uh, dispositions. There's We're a lot to them. Making dispos fun again. Yeah, you know? that's it. <laughs> were they ever though? No, uh, they, they were never fun. Yeah. But, uh, make it interesting at least. So, uh, thanks for hanging out with us today and we will catch you guys next time. Just make sure you follow the podcast wherever you listen and leave us a review. It really helps out. Yeah.